Nobody be alarmed. K State did get a commit, even though DY is here and not Drew. Uh, he's more than capable of breaking it down, mainly because he was, I think, the only person awake when Brock Heath decided to commit before 8 a.m. on this Thursday morning. Uh, just, I mean, most most of these guys, I appreciate Brock Heath being timely about it and not waiting until you know, like six o'clock at night when everybody's busy. No, he just said, Hey, start your day with some good news. But K state has landed another member of their recruiting class in the class of 2025. And I know everybody's waiting on, on how it's going to play out with Lincoln cure and everything else. But the 11th commit of this class for K state is significant because it's an on three, four star. And if you look at the industry ranking, he's the second highest ranked commit of the class so far for K state, another offensive lineman joining uh, Will Kimna, who's already on board on the offensive line. And this is also a local win for K-State because it's it's a Blue Valley Northwest guy. And uh, this has been one that K-State's been working at for, for a while. And uh, getting it closed, I think, today, maybe not necessarily a surprise that K-State won out, but just kind of, oh, hey, it's happening today. Uh, that's That's a pretty big deal for them. Yeah, a few things is, yeah, he's the second highest ranked commit at court now, according to the on three industry ranking. If it's just on three, he's number one. So that that's one point. The second point is uh, in the on three industry ranking, he's number two. Who's number one? The other offensive lineman. So this is another, you know, I would say data point of Connor Riley knows what he's doing. Um, not only can he coach on the field, and we know that he can do that. He can recruit too. He's probably underrated and doesn't get doesn't get enough credit in that form. Think about what they brought in last year, right? With Caden Massey and Gus Hawkins and Kyle Rockers and Ryan Howard. And you can probably, you should um, include Navarro Shunky in that, the, the Dakota line. Just because he's a walk-on doesn't mean he shouldn't be included. Just because it wasn't a, a typical walk-on situation. Um, if they didn't have that advantage that they could use, uh, he would have been a scholarship player. I mean, that guy was a four-star on multiple networks. So those are the other things. The third one's a little bit of a funnier angle that I'm taking. You mentioned uh, he didn't mess around. He committed, committed before 8 a.m. And I was just like, he's treating this like a school day, right? You get up and you start your day, go to school. Made sense. One of his finalists was Northwestern that he was considering because of their academic prestige. Yeah, no. This is the this was a, a, a nice thing, and I think it's good that you point out what was done in recruiting last year with the offensive linemen, because when all is said and done, and you go and look at those guys, I mean, Gus Hawkins shot up the rankings throughout the entirety of last year. He ends up in the industry ranking being a top one hundred and seventy guy, but on on three, he was all the way up to number fifty two in the country. He had four star status from on three twenty four seven and ESPN. And then, like you mentioned, Shunky's in there. Uh, Kyle Rocker's also highly thought of. Caden Massey had four-star status on 24-7 and uh, was pretty highly ranked as well. So this has been a continuation of what we know Connor Riley can do. And I think another thing that's uh, a great example of this is the fact that we know K-State has missed out on a lineman or two that they really thought that they wanted. They would have taken that guy. We know that that all Geyer is one of those into in the mix. But when, you know, you can lose an offensive lineman that's highly thought of and still bring in another one. And like, this is, this is what's next on the list. That's a pretty good sign of, of some healthy recruiting. Now, in terms of what Brock Heath is and, and what the expectation is at K state, how do you see him as a, as a prospect? Yeah, just a, I think he's going to be a solid player uh, chance to be a multi-year starter at Kansas state. He is a really good mover. Um, and he has heavy hands in terms of, you know, point of attack, physicality, a little bit of nastiness. You'd like him to get a little bit more of that, a little bit of a mean streak. Uh, but he is competitive. If you ask his high school coach, he already put it out there. One of the more competitive guys he has. So that's something that's probably in there that can be brought out that maybe hasn't been seen because he is competitive. He wants to win. Uh, but – in terms of nastiness, you probably want to see a little bit more of it, uh, but athletic, very, very athletic guy on the interior, someone that you're going to be able to pull with um, fairly easy. You did see him finish there with a pretty mean streak, so he's got a little bit of that at times. You want it to be more consistent. 
but in terms of upside, just because of how well he moves as an interior lineman, and he's going to put on more weight, um, and he's probably going to you know play around 300 pounds. I would think at the end and at the end of the day, uh, probably not too dissimilar to someone like uh, Andrew Line Gang, uh, so to speak, from a size standpoint. I would think. Uh, but the athletic, the athletic ability is really what stands out to me. Just how mobile he can be in that frame while playing on the interior. In in terms of you know how how case that you mentioned Northwestern was one of the the ones involved. What what do you think it was that pushed K State over the top here? You know, the as long as they recruited him, they were on him for a while. They've recruited him hard for a while. Uh, family tradition in a ways he is a legacy. His grandpa played at K State. I believe his dad played basketball at K State. They recruited his older brother Jackson um, at K State. They didn't take him, and I think he went Ivy League if I remember correctly. So this is a family that's got a lot of purple in it. So that certainly helped. And I think, to be quite honest, closing a McGuire Richmond from Blue Valley the way that they did helped a lot too because the two are very very close. Well, it seems like uh, one of those situations for K-State where this is also the, the benefit of being one of the, the in-state programs and, and building up kind of the, the cachet that comes with what they've done and their recruiting. Now, uh, another thing that people will be interested in because, you know, you get a Kansas guy and they, they want to see success quickly. So how quickly do you think Brock Heath could get up to speed to where, you know, we're talking about him actually being in the mix to get reps on the offensive line because the last couple of years k-state's had some young offensive linemen that maybe in in different seasons would have had the ability to get some more reps but k-state's just had so much consistency with experience uh on the offensive offensive line those guys weren't needed but when brock heath gets here next season how long do you think it would take before he could get onto the field yeah i mean i'm not going to go out on a limb and say he's a year one guy those are extremely rare on the offensive line. I think Cooper Beebe was even year two. So, uh, and and he was walking into an offensive line that was a, much less decorated at the time and wasn't as further along as a group. So he had a better situation in terms of available playing time uh, back then. Um, yeah, and I think he, a lot of the Kansas State coaches and maybe his family would agree on, on that situation. Turn to Brock Heath, look, the way he understands angles, and you can tell that by the way he positions his body when he when he blocks, and you know he he has a lot of the IQ stuff down already. Then obviously, there's a lot of refinement, and Connor Riley would be the first to tell you we got to refine this, we got to refine that, refine this, refine that. From a technique standpoint, you're never a finished product or a perfect um, in that regard. But he's kind of far along in that, and he's pretty mobile. You need to tack on some weight. Part of this is going to be who's back when he's ready to play because something that we have picked on with Connor Riley picked up on is that not that you don't have to compete your butt off to keep your starting spot, but once you get it, he is a loyalty to you, right? Uh, he sticks with you through thick and through thin, even if you're – you know, on a cold streak or what, you're going to be that guy that he sticks with because he trusts you. There's a lot of trust and loyalty factor once he buys into you. So some of that will depend on when Brock Keith is ready. Is there a spot that's vacant that he can take? Uh, because most of that is unknown at this time because they're going to be breaking in a few new guys this year, right? A, t a tackle. Mm -hmm. You're going to have Easton Kilty, Carver Willis, maybe John Pastore. A guard, you know, you have Taylor Portier, Hadley Panzer. How much are we going to see of uh, Sam Hecht and Andrew Leingag as well? So some of that will depend on well, who are the returning starters, who are those guys with season production once Brock Heath gets to the point where he's ready to play. I think that's where we are right now with guys like John Pastore and Andrew Leingag. They're ready to contribute. They're ready to play. But you got guys in front of them that may have a little bit more trust, a little bit more of a, uh, yeah, trust factor there with Connor Riley. Yeah, I, I want uh, I want it to, this to be known as well. Uh, I think Brock Heath might be one of the more 
uh, unique uh, recruits in the sense of he has his own website. Go, you can go to BrockHeath.com, and it's like a, a good little like landing tool for people wanting to recruit him because uh, it explains his position and everything and then uh, a bunch of other info and everything about him and uh, explains kind of uh, some of his background. So like it, it lists right there, he says uh, he comes from a family of elite athletes, has three older brothers who were highly recruited and played D1 football. His brother Jackson that you mentioned played tight end at Columbia uh, for a handful of seasons. And then uh, his, brother, Blake. His, his brother Blake was a starting linebacker at Nebraska – uh, from 07 to 09, and then uh, brother Tyler was quarterback at KU from 06 to 08, and then it mentions his dad uh, playing well, basketball did. at K-State. So. I didn't even know about Tyler. Blake Lawrence, I think it's a half-brother, the one that played in Nebraska, I think is the CEO of Open Doors. Well, there you go. So uh, that's I, I I love the the uniqueness of going out and uh, having something a little different for uh, the the coaches that are recruiting you to go see. Giving give them all the information up front. Don't make them dig. Makes it a little bit easier. And uh, Brock Heath is the newest commit of K State's twenty twenty five recruiting class. So they stand at eleven commitments now. We are a week away from the fourth of July. I ask Drew this every time K State gets a commit. Uh, so I'll, I'll give it to you this time. What number of commitments do you think K-State stands at after 4th of July weekend? Um, I will say, I'm trying to think, and I just actually, it's funny because I just tried to like brainstorm that a little bit. I will say that's 11, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say 14. Do you, do you want to paint the picture at all, or are you just 14, and uh, we'll see how they get there. There are enough options that could get them to that spot. I'll say two of the next three I'm fairly confident in, Lincoln Cure and Monteria Wellston being in the class by then. Fairly confident. So you only need one more. I, I feel like I can get a wild card there. What I will say is, based on what's left and – maybe what isn't as well. And then a couple of new offers like RJ Collins and, and Mike, uh, I think you pronounce his name, Hake from South Dakota. Don't know how quickly those will happen, but you never know um, because they've both been on campus. They can't. So there might be a better shot that it's more than 14 rather than less than 14. Yeah. I think that's probably a, a good way to put it where 14 might be the benchmark, but and there's a real scenario where it's no less than that, and it could be more. So K-State in a good spot, and certainly the uh, commitment of Brock Heath is a big one because you can't undersell how important it is to continue landing some of the best players in the state of Kansas. And in this 2025 class, which is one of the best that Kansas has ever seen, and you have more national recruits than ever, uh, especially in terms of certain circumstances that are playing out with some of the other guys. We know that Dawson Merritt and Jane Woods have already committed to Alabama and Penn State. Uh, others seem likely to be heading out of state as well. And that's just what happens with all this talent. K-State has already landed uh, a, a pair of guys in the state that are important in Brock Heath and McGuire Richmond, and now uh, Lincoln Cure might be on the horizon for them. So significant pickup for K-State in the talent and just kind of the momentum department with Brock Heath. So, that will do it for us. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. If you want more on the Brock Heath commitment and everything else going on with K-State football and basketball, head over to kstateonline.com and keep it locked in right here on KSO for uh, all of your commitment breakdowns and everything else going on with the Wildcats. Depending on when you're watching this, uh, we'll know who K-State's Big 12 basketball opponents this season are. We'll have a breakdown of that later today here on the KSO YouTube as well. So we are out of here, and we'll talk to you again soon.